Welcome to Death Metal Chronicles. I'm not even sure what I'm gonna name this. I guess this is February the 23rd episode on technology. Uh, all those have technology adventures, because I don't actually have any things, so I guess it's just Death Metal Chronicles Weekend Edition. I should probably watch this come out from the core. T into it. So I guess this episode should be called The Blood Orange Conversations. Oh, I hear that. Yeah. I got this tea off of Amazon. It's some blood orange tea. It's pretty legit. Pretty much the best tea you can get. Plus, it's non caffeinated. So, after you've had your, you know, second pot of coffee, uh, you can enjoy some some blood orange. <laughs> That's what you're into. So this week I've been really excited. Oh yeah, that's the name of our episode. It's the House of Cards episode. Holy shit. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, it's our House of Cards episode. I, uh... I am really, really, really impressed with House of Cards. I actually like to watch the British version. I haven't, uh, I haven't actually watched the, the British one. I think that would be pretty cool. Um, I'm really getting into it. I've, I've watched the first season already, and now I'm into the second season. Um, I think it's really interesting that, like, with the show, if you haven't watched it, House of Cards is on, uh, Netflix, and it's un, uh, under their license distribution. Um, they uh, they started it about two years ago. Um, it actually was pushed out in 2011 as an original idea. Um, so they, they had a bit of time in between them trying to decide on, on making the show and all. Here's a comment from uh, Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey's the, the main star, if you haven't watched the show. Um, Spacey supported the decision to release all the episodes at once, believing that this type of release pattern will increasingly will be increasingly common with television shows, he said. When I ask my friends what they did with their weekend, they say, oh, I stayed in and watched three seasons of Breaking Bad, or it's, or it's two seasons of Game of Thrones. He was officially cast in March 18th, 2011. Nevertheless, uh, this is another comment um, from an article that I had read on uh, Washington Post, um, which I found was really, really interesting. Um, that the Independent praised Spacey's portrayal as a more menacing character, hiding his rage behind a th southern charm and an old-fashioned courtesy. Um, what's interesting, too, is the, the Washington Post had came out with an article um, called uh, Under Maryland Politics, how did the House of Cards get millions in Maryland tax credits? One of my favorite comments from uh, Thomas D. Lorenzo is, you know, on, on tax loopholes. And you gotta close, close those loopholes, because, you know, God forbid the government get one less dollar. You gotta close those loopholes, you know I mean? We can't have people keeping more of their money. Um, so the article's by Jenna Johnson. Uh, the House of Cards has delayed filming in its third season until Maryland lawmakers approve legislation that would allow the show's production company to collect millions of more tax credits. So how exactly do these tax credits work? I had Jack Jerbs, director of the Maryland Film Office, walk me through how this happens and the numbers behind the tax credits cards 
House of Cards has received. Step 1. The television or movie production companies express interest. The first question companies ask is not, tell us about this location or that location. Nope, Derb says, the first question is usually, what tax credits do you have? Making a hit series or blockbuster movie is a business, and producers are easily enticed by the idea of having millions of tax dollars. Of, of saving millions of tax dollars. The production company uh, applies. The company executives say what they plan to do and how long they plan to work and how much they plan to spend as the state will reimburse them for a chunk of production expenses incurred in Maryland. The Maryland Film Office reviews this application and will then reserve some tax credits for the company. Most years, the office has about $7.5 million to divvy up, although last year it had $25 million, thanks to legislators, approving a bump. Filming begins and ends. Step 3. This is the fun part. Locals help build and decorate sets. Kevin Spacey spottings happen, and the governor is invited to visit the set. During the filming of Season 2, the Maryland House of Delicates chamber was transformed into a faux U.S. Senate chamber. Much to the delight and amusement of lawmakers, and the show finally airs it's required to include this closing credit. Maryland Film Office, Maryland, Maryland Film Office, Maryland Department of Business and Economic Development. With 180 days of wrapping, the production company has to give the film office closing documentation, including numbers of Maryland residents who were hired to work, businesses impacted, payroll sheets and receipts, along with the auditor's report. In step four, the state determines the final tax credit amount. Within a month or two, the film office finishes its review of that mountain of documentation and determines the exact amount for the refundable tax credit. The production company receives that money when it files its Maryland taxes, so often there is a lag time between the show being filmed and the production company getting its refund. Typically, companies are reimbursed for about a quarter of the qualified expenses, and the film office has a detailed list of what is qualified and not. Then the article goes into like a breakdown of the money and um, like expenditure for season one of the show was sixty three million dollars, um, and talk about how eighteen hundred Maryland businesses were involved and nearly. 2,200 Marylanders were hired as cast and crew. Uh, what I do want to highlight is the different arguments and commentary you get on the comments section of the article, which I find is even more important because you kind of find out what are in people's minds about it. Wait, lower from this guy, NVTS13. Wait, lower taxes promote growth and economic development? That's strange. That's not what the government, Governor O'Malley has been telling me for the last several years. How is it fair that politically connected firms or specific industries get breaks and credits while smaller regular firms get hosed and higher taxes? Politicians shouldn't be able to pick and choose which companies they like and don't like. If the lower rates are good enough for one company, they should be good enough for all. Just kidding, DC writes. Anytime states or cities compete against each other for business, it's a zero-sum game for citizens. Tax money goes to pay for stadiums and lure manufacturers and to suck up TV movie production. But in the end, it does not create any more or any of these things. It just moves it around. So no new jobs are created. It's just tax money going to businesses equaling corporate welfare with no net gain for the people. Gonzo4 writes, I'd love to see a breakdown of that $138 million positive economic benefit. Most independent studies show these are money-losing propositions for states. They're extortion by Hollywood and a ripoff, pure and simple. It's one of the few things right-wing and left-wing economic groups agree on. <laughs> I certainly approve. 
I I superbly agree with the fact of of all three commenters that literally I mean it just shows the insanity that goes on in America where you know you can have unemployment rates of upwards in a 50% in places like Baltimore where this show is filmed and so you're taking tax money to give to a company to hire people so supposedly it's good for the community of Maryland so breaking that down taxes are just and then it's just and morally right if the Maryland Film Office gives this out to companies. And then it's morally just for the companies to then hire people with money that they extorted. So the morality of it is, it's, it's kind of the whole idea of the show as well. Which I kind of almost agree with why, how Washington Post put it out. Because it's kind of the idea of House of Cards. It shows the reality of pol- politics in general. That it has nothing to do with, with being just and morally correct and, and not doing violence. It has everything, to, government in general, has everything to do with taking money from one group to give to another to further the means and ends of whatever group is politically connected. And how morally corrupt within the show I don't want to give away too much stuff but in the show uh, one of the one of the guys um is just a basically a shill for what other politician but you don't really realize the the lobbyists and the people behind these politicians that are doing these things so if it's politically convenient for a specific politician to enact whatever legislation it is they're just going to enact the legislation and it has nothing to do with their constituents of whatever state that they're actually from it has everything to do with how are they connected to different companies different um, people groups that just want something out of these politicians and in a way i kind of kind of agree with how House of Cards has uh, done their their things. An- another part of it, you know, I talked about it first, was how Kevin Spacey, who was an executive producer within the show, if you didn't know, that's also how he gets, you know, he says statements because he actually gets to decide uh, part of the decisions of the show, and for them to release um, their content through distribution platform of Netflix, which then allows them to probably more time to film. So they have, you know, a, they order a season. So a production company is given an order by whatever hosting company, um, or distribution company that's putting them out. So whether it's Cox or Communications um, or, you know, Fox or whoever it is. So they order a specific amount of shows. And they have to get it done within a specific amount of time, which is ever in their contract. So then they get done with that amount of shows. And so say it's, you know, 180 days and they have to be able to complete uh, 12 episodes, which is a, long, a lot of episodes, which I, I highly doubt it's 180 days, but whatever it is. Then they put it up on their platform, uh, which is Netflix, and then you're able to watch, you know, all seven shows at one time, you know. Um, so for someone, you know, spending a weekend with their family, they just want to watch House of Cards and just kick it, um, that's what they're going to do, just watch, you know, four episodes of it in a row. Well, it's, they're making a con, a, a cognitive decision on what they're watching and what type of media they're getting within their lives, which is completely different than, say... Where our grandparents had to go through, you know, you you only listen to the radio, and then uh, the radio turned into the the black and white television, and from <laughs> seven a.m. till um, seven p.m. you had three or four channels that were pumping out information of whatever politicians wanted you to know, <laughs> and what NBC and 
and uh, the major broadcasting companies um, decided you you got to know. So whether it was, oh, now we're building new machines and everybody needs to uh, buy more war bonds because we have to we have to be ready for the war in, in Germany because we have to kill those evil Nazis who may happen to be Catholics and, and Protestant and, um, you know, Italians living in Germany. You know, we have to go there and, and kill them, so... You know, make sure that you're paying your war bonds and everything's going to be A-OK -okay because the broadcasters say so. Then get your sons ready to go fight, you know. So, taking it as extreme, the tinfoil had extreme, but, um, you know, you're able to decide what you want to watch and what you want to um, surround yourself with, you know, which is a huge. This is big. I mean, we don't necessarily have an ability right now to just watch certain shows and Game of Thrones has had to combat this by you know constantly paying money for people to go up on torrenting sites and try to take down their material um, and it's not a problem of people downloading it it's a problem of how they're hosting it it's a distribution problem uh, Wendell from Tech Syndicate's always talking about this. You know, it's not a problem with people downloading it. It's the problem with distribution and how you're putting out your content. Well, with they have an album called Zweihander. It's an eight-bit um, music that you can listen to that they've made themselves, and they actually want people to torrent it. And me as a as a creator, I put my stuff for less uh, darkness prevails. I put that on YouTube. Well. You know, I want people to be able to download my music, um, and if they want to take uh, something like Ant Toolbar and download it, please do. I support you in downloading my music, and then putting it on your iPod or, you know, your Android uh, phone and listening to it while you work out. You know, that's how I want you to. That's totally cool. Um, why wouldn't I want you to listen to my music, no matter how you get it? Um... So for me, my problem is not distribution. My distribution is through YouTube, and you can just go take Ant Toolbar, download it, and then download my music. Um, and it's Creative Commons. You can use it in your own shows and your own movies and do whatever the hell you want to do with it. I don't care. Um, now, the opposite is Game of Thrones. You can't just go find Game of Thrones on whatever. I guess they're on HBO or Showtime. I don't even watch a show. But you can't just go on the website and just go watch five or six episodes, which is a huge problem distribution and is the most torrented, um, downloaded, supposedly illegally show of all time. And there's a reason people like it, people want to watch it, but they can't just sit down at a specific time and watch it or people aren't going to spend the money to get whatever DVR system that's going to be able to download it. Some people just don't want that. Um, or have the time, you'll just set that up, which is fine. Um, now, on the opposite end of things with distribution, when it comes to a show like House of Cards, um, what they're not talking about, they're just talking about, oh, these tax credits are bad. Uh, I guess, you know, you gotta, the government needs to keep more money, you know, so um, you gotta, gotta, Stop those loopholes. <laughs> um, on the opposite end is I, I heard a different uh, a different filmmaker talking about how he literally refuses to do business in America anymore because it doesn't really help him to put content out if the government's just going to take 50% of his earnings, which is correct. So if you're a production company, and so you spend, uh, you know, $100 million, and the government then wants $50 million of what you've made, how is it even possible that you'd be able to have enough money to make your next thing? So this is where we get into a problem of the income tax in general, is unjust. Well, it already, with this whole article of, how, you know, the House of Cards and gets millions of Maryland tax credits. Well, 
it isn't the issue of House of Cards getting tax credits. It's the issue of the income tax in general. So, as a society, we are, you know, completely surrounded by all these different towns and states and, and the government as a whole trying to take your money for whatever ends they want to use it for, which is normally nefarious ends, giving to their cronies like Verizon or whoever else, uh, to then surveil you and then run counterintelligence on you. So, you know, this is where, you know, the, you, there's an exact morality towards it, and, and no one who's our age really wants to fund that or deal with that, but it's a, it's a, like a problem. And whether you're, uh, you know, anarchist uh, Mennonite like I am, or, you know, you're a someone who, you know, wholeheartedly believes in fascism of utilizing government to uh, give money to companies to then, you know, do whatever they want with it. Um, are you really comfortable with then Verizon turning around and then collecting all of your information and then giving it to an intelligence agency to uh, prevent you from speaking out for whatever you want to speak out for? Or running intelligence on your friend who may not agree with the current political process at the time. So there, there, there's a morality towards it, and you have to be able to put all those things in context. The context of this article is not, oh, it's bad or good of the, the money being given to House of Cards or you know being taken from taxpayers. The morality of it is, why should there be an income tax? Before the 1920s, there wasn't an income tax. Well, how did the government make their money? Well, they had to make their money from importation costs and um, ex well, really extortion, extorting money from different people bringing goods into the country. Do I agree that it's right? No, but that was a way that they were able to do that, and it didn't necessarily impact someone who was a farmer in the middle of nowhere who just sold his goods to the, you know, the people around him. So this is taxation as a whole, and once you have taxation, you then enable government cronies to do what they're going to do, which is give money to their buddies, which is the, the whole idea of House of Cards in a way. You know, I think it's really a tragedy of the commons of of what happens when you give a government a mile, they'll take a nation, you know. So that that's my opinion of, of that. I mean, I, you may not agree with me. I mean, that's fine, but um, that's what I think. I just find it completely ridiculous that somehow that it's, it's okay for... Um, any state to take money from people. That's just completely ridiculous. So I thought something was pretty interesting. My uh, buddy, Pharrell Jundi. Matt runs a uh, their content there, and he had posted a article from the Long War, Long War Journal, a project of the Foundation for Defense Democracies. Al-Qaeda chief representative in Syria reportedly killed. So, Abu Khalid al-Suri, haven't actually read this, this will be news to you and to me, whose real name is Mohammed Bahia, has been reportedly killed in a suicide attack in Aleppo. Al-Sudi's death has been confirmed by several Twitter feeds, obviously a strategic source of information, managed by Ahura al-Sham and the Islamic Front. Al-Sudi, a long al-Qaeda, <laughs> stop saying it like Bush, Al-Qaeda operative, was a founding member of the Ahrar al-Sham and a senior leader in the organization at the time of his death. Ahrar 
is arguably the most powerful rebel organization within the Islamic Front, a coalition of rebel groups that was formed last year. Hassan Aboud, a top official at, in Al Haran Al Sha'am and the Islamic Front, confirmed Al Shudi's martyrdom in a tweet early this morning. The official Twitter feeds of the Islamic Front <laughs> so ridiculous. Say so that Al Shudi was killed along with his comrades in a suicide attack at one of the front's headquarters in Aleppo. And a hashtag commemorating al Suri's death is already being used on Jihadist Twitter pages. <laughs> oh, God. Of this writing, there are no official claim of responsibility for Shuri's death. Some reports of the social media implicate the Islamic State of Iraq and the Sham, ISIS, which is the recently disowned by Al-Qaeda's general command as a group responsible for the attack. Ashuri was a key figure in the dispute between ISIS and other jihadi groups inside Syria, including Arhar Sham and Al-Nasra Front, which is an official branch of the Al-Qaeda. In May 2013, Al-Qaeda emir Ahmad Zawahiri named al-Suri as the intermediary in the leadership disagreement between ISIS and the al-Nasr front. The dispute became public the previous month when ISIS emir Abu Bakr and al-Baghdadi attempted to subsume control of the al-Nasr front. Abu Muhammad al-Jundi Al-Julani, the emir of al-Nasra, rejected al-Baghdadi's order and directly reaffirmed his allegiance to Zawahiri instead. Furthering on, the Long War Journal reported in December 17, 2013, that al-Suri was a senior leader in Akhra al-Sham, in addition to being Zawahiri's main representative in Syria. U.S. intel officials told the Long War Journal that all Zawahiri's placement within al-Sham, alongside other senior al-Qaeda representatives, operatives in the group, revealed that al-Qaeda has influence in the organizations that are not officially recognized as affiliates or branches of the group. Al-Zuri's al-Qaeda role is long known in counterterrorism circles. The Spanish government accused him of serving as Osama bin Laden's chief courier in Europe prior to September 11th terrorist attacks. Spanish officials found that he carried surveillance tapes of the World Trade Center and other American landmarks from the operative who made the videos in al-Qaeda's senior leadership in Afghanistan. Shortly after the Long War Journal reported this al-Suri's dual-hated role in the Akhra al-Sham al-Qaeda in December 2013, the U.S. Treasury Department described al-Suri as al-Qaeda's representative in Syria. Treasury revealed that al-Qaeda supporter in Qatar had transferred nearly 600000 to al-Qaeda via al-Suri in 2013 and was preparing to transfer an additional 50000 Al-Khalid al-Zuhiri's Death, therefore, is a major development in the history of the Syrian war and al-Qaeda's role in it. However, al-Qaeda retains the loyalty of numerous other senior jihadists in the Syrian battlefield. I was hoping there was going to be some comments. Reader comments. Nope. No comments. Sadness. It is interesting, though, that we had U.S. Treasury running a counter threat, um, counter finance threat on um, Al Qaeda people who are operating in Syria. Don't get me wrong, I do believe that if someone does bad things to America, they should be smoke checked or at least captured and then tried to court. Something along those lines. Although, I'm very confused about how you could have someone making about 100 something or, you know, up to 200 something thousand dollars a year uh, in some office um, for the U.S. Treasury 
originally was started for um, taking in money and imposts for the United States to then fund its government operations now has turned into an intelligence agency <laughs> running intelligence operations on uh, on Al Qaeda you know members and things of that sort um, you know you give them a you give them a mile they'll take a nation you know so don't get me wrong I do think people should be out combating those people although I find it completely insane that you know that guy's making that kind of money and running, you know, doing those kind of operations. Take a lot of money, a lot of weeks, a lot of manpower uh, to be able to do something like that. Because um, obviously you have to get, you know, direct confirmation. You have to be able to, you know, from words and things like that. I mean, direct, uh, direct information from people. Um, you probably have to fly a lot of places. You know, just imagine how much money that is instead of, you know, instead of just trying to make up. Uh, a hypothesis on some guy trying to do things, um, why not just let him destabilize somebody else's country who gives a shit about Syria? I mean, let him implode for all I care. That's ridiculous. It has nothing to do with America at all. That's, you know, that's me. You may not agree. On ARS Technica... There was an article. Netflix may have gained a direct connection to the Comcast network. Netflix and Comcast have made peace with each other. May have may have made peace with each other. If they have, um, it could be a great news for users who are fresher with poor performance in Netflix on Comcast's network. App.net co-founder Brian Berg today posted a trace route on GitHub saying it shows that Comcast and Netflix now have direct adjacency. Looked at the host serving my Netflix stream today and noticed something new, he said. No clue if money is changing hands or not and the current path is what actually matters, but it appears that Comcast and Netflix have reached some sort of agreement regarding direct interconnection. Uh, tra he did like a trace uh, on his the IP address, you know, to show you know, what the traffic is. So you, basically, if you you don't know what you would be able to do is you'd run um, inside the terminal or inside of a program, and you would basically run, you know, wh how is this information getting to me? And then it just shows all the different nodes and all the different servers that it's going through, and then you'd be able to trace exactly how that's getting to you. Um, which he showed like a pictograph, or, you know, a, a, basically the lines within your terminal, which is what runs in the background, technically, of your actual computer. Comcast person, spokesperson declined to comment, we haven't heard back from Netflix back. GigaOM Stacy Higgin... Higgin? Higginbotham? Higginbotham? Reported that a source in the industry confirmed there is a direct interconnection agreement between Netflix and Comcast, but declined to comment further, only saying that it was a recent development. Netflix and its internet transit providers have been warring with consumer ISPs like Comcast, Time Warner, and Verizon for many months. To prepare better performance to its customers, Netflix offers a peer directly with consumer ISPs that is exchange traffic without intermediary and to place its video caches inside ISP networks to get them closer to the consumers. While some ISPs have accepted this offers, others have refused, saying Netflix should have to pay to get better access to home consumers. A deal between Netflix and Comcast would involve peering, caching, or both. Netflix performance on Comcast has been dropping for months, but Comcast may have incentive to partner with Netflix in order to gain the good graces of regulators. Who will examine its proposed purchase of Time Warner Cable? Netflix may also be more willing to negotiate with ISPs in general, given a recent court order decision that gutted network neutrality laws allowing ISPs to block or de- grade third-party traffic. Comcast, however, is still bound by those neutrality rules since rules until 2018 because of the condition of the 2011 purchase of NBC Universal. 
As we wrote earlier today, Verizon remains locked in the battle of Netflix and Cogent, one of the companies that Netflix pays to distribute its traffic. <sighs> that's funny. The ISP, uh, some comment from this guy named Form Rain. That's funny. The ISP that still has to follow network neutrality guidelines up to 2018 seems to be working with content providers to deliver their customers better service. Meanwhile, the ISP that that literally does not give a fuck about anyone anymore and does not have to follow network neutrality is demanding money from content providers to use their pipes. It's as if network neutrality is a good thing. <laughs> oh, and then some guy put his trace route on there too. Uh, oddly, my trace trace cert results are decidedly different. And he shows his, you know, IP and all that stuff. And... Comcast just enabled HBO to go on Samsung's TV, too. I don't know if Comcast is a change of heart or they're trying to win support for their merger with Time Warner. <laughs> Either way, it means they start providing better service to its customers. <laughs> I like these commenters are good. They're less trolly at least. More fun but you know less trolly. I share your concern about Comcast only doing this because of their need with the Time Warner cable merger approved. The future challenge is how can the US consumer as well as local and federal governments persuade these giant internet monopolies to give customers inter internet services they provide for. So what this guy's commenting on is the fact that most of these ISPs are so, you know, you supposedly order, you know, say 200 kilobytes of data um, at one time. Well, this doesn't say that you're going to get 200 kilobytes of data. It means that you can get up to 200 kilobytes per second of data. What these companies are doing is is saying oh well, we're abiding by these rules that the FCC has put you know allowed us to use and then they're basically for certain times of the day they will set on their servers and probably even further on than that but they'll just outright say oh everybody's going to get 10 kilobytes per second at one time that's all you get for this amount of time especially from say uh, 5 p.m. until 7 p.m. That's when everybody else is on, so you just limit the amount of bandwidth, and then you could save your company from having a bunch of lines and servers being used and all th stuff like that. So then you don't have to pay extra money in case they go down or whether you have to like shift more of the service onto your partner company that you partner with. So this is where all these leasing agreements come in line with Cogent and all these people where you're, you're having people uh, given um, a certain amount of bandwidth to put over their um, servers that they own and their tubes and pipes. Um, this guy's right on the money. This guy's BB15. Um, and internet cable providers from favoring their services, pay-per-view, Redbox streaming over Netflix and YouTube. This guy knows exactly what he's talking about. Um, any sort of net neutrality, government involvement in anything is probably, and which has been proven now lately, that it is completely disastrous for the common person. Um, you do not have uh, democracy within choosing um, what a government legislature will do when... Time Warner Cable then says, hey, politician, we will pay you $1 million to let us only be the internet service provider for, say, Washington, D.C. Bam. And then now, only Time Warner Cable can then do um, that content in that area. There is no possible way that that is just. And then you have people trying to compete like Google and other companies, no, I mean, they're just as evil as everybody else. But as, you know, Tech Senate going to talk about, you know, having non-evil ISPs, small, tiny-based companies that just want to be able to 
put a cable somewhere, they're not allowed to do that. And it's 100% legal in most places. So get your t- uh, your pitchforks and your tinfoil hats and go to fight because I swear uh, it's just going to get worse. And then when you have things like this where Time Warner Cable is going to be purchased by um, another company, um, oh man, you better be in for it. Because you know, this is also the same week, this is on ARS Technica where they talk about how um, you know the FCC throws out plan to question reporters about news coverage. So, you know, it's okay if the FCC puts out a law about, you know, net neutrality and allowing content to go whatever pipes they want to let the pipes through. But then it's not okay for them to have a voice over what they tell you? Morality is the same. And there's no difference. Having the FCC involved is dangerous. I say, break up the FCC. But who will command the tubes? Who will build the roads? Uh, yeah. Who will build the roads? <laughs> who will build the tubes? FCC throws out plan to question reporters about news coverage on ARS Technica. Federal Communications Commission has backtracked on a plan to ask journal uh, journalists about news coverage decisions after protest from one of the commission's members. Part of the commission's Republican minority wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal on February the 10th, criticizing the FCC on the FCC study on the news media, saying that the government has no place pressuring media organizations into covering certain stories, Pai wrote. His name's uh, Ahit Pai. Uh, he wrote, uh, last May the FCC proposed an ins- initiative to thrust the federal government into newsrooms across the country with its multi-market study of critical information needs, or CIN, the agency plans to send researchers to grill reporters, editors, and station owners about how they decide which stories to run. A field test in Columbia, South Carolina is scheduled to begin this spring. The purpose of the CIN, according to FCC, is to ferret out information from television and radio broadcasters about the process by which stories are selected and how often Stations cover critical information needs along with perceived station bias and perceived responsiveness to un- underserved populations. Underserved populations. Whew, man. Some strong language there. One question for reporters is, Have you ever suggested coverage of what you considered a story with critical information for your customers that were rejected by management? Follow-up questions ask for specifics about how editorial discretion is exercised and well as reasoning behind the decisions. Yesterday, FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler told the staff to remove the offending questions. A commission statement today said... The statement noted that FCC is required to report to Congress every three years on the barriers that may prevent entrepreneurs and small businesses from competing in small media marketplace and pursue policies to eliminate uh, eliminate those barriers. To fulfill that obligation in a meaningful way, FCC Office of Communications Business Opportunities consulted with academic researchers in 2012 and selected a contractor to design a study which would inform the FCC's report to Congress. (laughs) However, in course of FCC review and public comment, concerns were raised that some of the questions may not have been appropriate. The statement concluded Chairman Wheeler suggested or agreed with the survey questions in the study directed toward media outlet managers, news directors, and reporters overstepped the bounds of what is required. Last week, Chairman Wheeler informed lawmakers that the commission has no intention of regulating political or other speech of journalists or broadcasters and would be modifying the draft study. (laughs) Yesterday, the chairman directed those questions to be removed entirely. 
The FCC is planning to test out the study in Colombia after expanding it to more areas. That has been canceled until the study is changed. The pilot will not be undertaken until a new study design is final, the FCC statement said. Any subsequent market studies conducted by the FCC, if determined necessary, will not seek participation from or include questions for media owners, news directors, or reporters. I'm looking forward to the comments on this. <laughs> Here we go. From Baron Von Robber. <laughs> ah, I would have liked to have seen Fox questionnaire. Answer whatever Mr. Rudock says. Answer whatever Mr. Murdoch says. Answer whatever Mr. Murdoch says. <laughs> <laughs> Mujokan. The reason for the study goes back to 2012. The SAC wanted to loosen registration regulations on cross ownership of radio, television, and newspapers. However, when they tried to change the rules, there was a big backlash because only 3.6% of TV stations and 8% of radio stations were owned by minorities. So the FCC had to go back and do a big study to show that minorities were well enough served by the media, so it didn't matter that they didn't own television radio stations, so it was okay if they loosened up the regulations and permitted greater monopolization. For some reason, an FCC commissioner decided that it was a bad, bad thing. Maybe he did not want the chance of a survey that showed minorities would loosen out, would lose out with deregulation. I don't know. Now the right-wing media has turned into a conspiracy theory that the FCC is going to somehow screw them over. <laughs> Sorry, guys, they were trying to help big business. They're generally trying to get rid of regulations. If the outcome of canceling this study is, we do not know what the effect of minority access to media will be, and therefore cannot deregulate, <laughs> then I say cancel the study. Somehow I think the overcome is going to be we do not know the effect on minority access to media will be, and therefore, we may need, we may as well deregulate. <laughs> wow. Yeah, clearly the fear is unjustified because no American federal agency today is eroding fundamental constitutional rights, <laughs> which got a plus 43 rating, and the other guy's comment got a plus 16 positive rating. Well, the FCC has to get clear channels, mother may I, before they can do anything in radio. Otherwise, they'll have lobbyists' hands shoved so far up the rump, they won't be able to sit for a week as a puppet show proceeds. <laughs> Tundra Walker, a reader favorite. <laughs> This is so freaking good. <laughs> I'm certainly a big fan of uh, of ARS Technica and the way they do their comments because it yeah you know, it shows participation you know so some guy can write uh, you know an article and then you know you get some fantastic commentary. Um, you know, as the airwaves belong to the public and not to the media conglomerates, the FCC has vested interest to see that they are used in a way that benefits the public? No. The equal time rule, which states that broadcasters must provide equal broadcast time to all candidates for a particular office. The right of rebuttal, which requires broadcasters to provide an opportunity for candidates to respond to criticisms made against them. A station cannot air an attack on a candidate and fail to give the target of the attack a chance to respond. The Fairness Doctrine, which states that the broadcaster who airs a controversial program must provide time air opposing views. This has not been enforced since Reagan ordered it to be stricken in 85, removed in 87, Obviously, cable companies, non-public airways, are exempt. I do not know what the big deal is, says James, who only got one positive vote. But why does the FCC need to know about the newspaper's editorial decisions in order to address the cross-ownership or minority-ownership question? 
<laughs> Plus 13. I am certainly a fan. So, something that I really like to do lately is now do a uh, Military Times Roulette. Military Times. Let's see. Military Times Roulette. Closing my eyes now. The first thing. Open. Navy develops world's smallest guided missile. There's some guy with like, he's got a cool beard and like an orange uh, missile in his hands. It's like maybe like three feet long. As the military relies more and more on unmanned aerial vehicles to carry out pinpoint strikes, their services need smaller munitions to arm them. And that's why, that's where Spike comes in. Weighing five pounds, this mini missile developed by the Navy is many, many times lighter than the hundred pound Hellfires typically carried by the UAVs. Unmanned area vehicles, UAVs. But still packs a precision punch. Scott O'Neill, who is overseeing its development, calls Spike the world's smallest guided missile. Most of our weapons are fairly large because we're taking out very big targets, O'Neill said. The executive director of Naval Air Warfare Center Weapons Division, NAWCWD, told Navy Times in February 2012 phone interview. We have started looking at with miniaturization of electronics. What does that mean in weaponry? How small can we make weapons and keep them effective against targets that we're talking about? Spike is an in-house project completely developed and funded by NAVAIR at Naval Air Weapons Station, China Lake, California. For now, it's a cool toy to help train NAVS... NAWID? Here's... N A W C W D. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm supposed to say that. The Nawids? The Nasid? Nawid. Engineers on miniature munition systems, O'Neill said. But it's up for grabs if the services are interested in fielding it. Fleet Forces Command and different elements of the and different elements of the Navy <laughs> and other services are aware they're interested. It's just a matter of budgets where they are, O'Neill said. If somebody wanted to pick this up and make it a program, we stand ready to support that. The missile measures two and a half inches in diameter and costs $50,000 with off-the-shelf parts. One of the real issues with weapon systems is that they're really, really expensive. Project lead Greg Wheelock said, Set, said in why is that one word said in a phone interview and so we've taken an alternative with this one by using commercial technology we can keep cost per unit really down low so it becomes a very affordable system for the services O'Neill added that if the project went well went into production now so I, I, there's gotta be a way you're supposed to say this Fucking acronyms um, would be able to use its proprietary design to strike a deal with companies that build cell phone components, for instance, at a high volume and lower cost. To be sure, the Navy built Spike is in no relation to the anti tank missile made by the Israeli defense firm Rafael and sold under the brand name of Spike. Everyone from the Marine Corps, Naval Special Warfare, and the Special Operations Forces com community to intelligence agencies and Defense Department affiliated civilian organizations have expressed interest. Department of Defense, Defense Department affiliated civilian organizations have expressed interest in Spike, O'Neill said, a weapon that would be shipped, ship mounted for use against small boat swarms or shoulder fired on the battlefield. Now we freaking sweet. Put 15 of those suckers. 5, 10, 15, 20 pounds. You could totally hump that. It's no problem. Guided by a tiny camera, Spike is designed to fire at stationary or moving soft targets like people. 
<laughs> lightly armored vehicle and read that slow like moving soft targets like people question mark <laughs> lightly armored vehicle structures boats and small aircraft while minimizing the chances for collateral da collateral collateral damage will lock said it gives a person a guided missile that's going to take out the target without blowing up the rest of the neighborhood, he said. <laughs> it's guided by the same technology as a cell phone camera, O'Neill said. A camera on the missile inside takes an image of what it sees. The person shooting can enlarge the picture and pick the target, put a box around the person or boat or plane, and Spike will track it. Now it's freaking sweet. It goes really fast for a long way, Willock said, but its speed and... Range are classified. O'Neill added that the limit on Spike's range is the camera it's equipped with. As camera technology evolves, they can use more high-definition cameras to get more detailed image from farther away. It's also designed to be launched from a variety of platforms, Willock said, from the ground and kind of stationary launcher. From the air, we've launched it from a UAV, and we're also designing it to be shoulder-launched. The counter unmanned airborne systems cap capability is of particular interest to the Army when hosted a successful test launch this summer at the Picatinny Arsenal in New Jersey. The system isn't necessarily ready to go to fleet right now, but what we've done is we've demonstrated that we can launch this and control the weapon and hit a target from launching it from an air platform, and then we've launched it from the ground platforms against moving targets, O'Neill said. Following the test, Willock said that the team is redesigning the cell phone camera seeker to get more detailed image. They're also looking at designing a variant with collapsible wings, which are more suited to a tube launcher fired from the shoulder. The team will continue to tweak the design and use Spike to train its engineers in miniature weapon systems, O'Neill said. But the cost of fielding Spike is beyond what his organization can cover. There's a lot of what we call qualification work that has been done, that has to be done, and to make sure you know the designs can be produced and what's produced is reliable, he said. That's work we have to be done by one of the services if they decide to move, decide to move this to an operational capability. No comments. Well, that's horrible. Sounds pretty sweet. I like the idea. Especially something that's precision that uh, can be humped, which is important these days. When you need to send people in to go places, to, you know, take care of problems without having a lot of weight. Uh, you know, a five pound, you know, missile with, you know, maybe another pound or two pounds for the tube. Um, it's pretty fantastic. I mean, you can't really get much more precision than that, um, with the weight, obviously. Congressman wants one official to coordinate POW's release. I think I may have talked about this the last time. I'm pretty sure I did, but I'll go through anyways. Um... A frame grab from the video's release by Taliban 2010 shows a man believed to be specialist Bowie Bergdahl, the only known American service member being held in captivity in Afghanistan. In a letter Tuesday, Republican or Re Tuesday, Representative Duncan Hunter, Republican of California, a member of the House Armed Services Committee, asked Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel to appoint a single official to better coordinate the government efforts to rescue. You know, ugh, I'll, I'll go through this for my rant. It's a rant 30 all day. <laughs> for almost five years, a host of military and State Department officials have worked to free prisoner of war Army Sergeant Bowie Bergdahl, but one Republican lawmaker is concerned that all the effort is not sufficiently focused to bring him home. In a letter Tuesday, Representative Duncan Hunter Republican of California, member of the House, you know, blah, 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 blah. The longest-held American military prisoner since Vietnam War. I believe it to be extraordinarily beneficial to establish a centralized control of the Bergdahl 
operation that is finally capable of linking broader government activity, wrote Hunter. A former Marine who served a combat tour in Afghanistan, it is absolutely critical that efforts to free Bergdahl are not overcome by bureaucracy. On Tuesday, Washington Post reported the White House is attempting to resume talks with Taliban fighters to try to free Bergdahl. That includes a possible release of five prisoners being held at Guantanamo Bay in exchange for the American soldier. Defense officials have not commented on specifics, but last Friday, the Pentagon's top woman, Rear Admiral spokesperson, spokesman, Rear Admiral John Kirby said he's been gone too long and we're working very hard to see if we can't get him returned. The effort has included officials from the Pentagon, the State Department, and other agencies, according to the Post in his letter. Hunter said that while the U.S. Central Command is the official lead on the effort, I'm concerned about the lack of cohesiveness and interagency coordination overall. He also praised the efforts of Free Bergdahl to date, but noted it is important that we as a nation direct all necessary operational resources and personnel to the ongoing effort to bring him home. Bergdahl, an Idaho native, was taken prisoner in Afghanistan in June 30, 2009. A proof-of-life video showing the 27-year-old soldier was released by his captors in January. And no fucking comments. It's fucking disgusting. You know, so the FCC can go gallivant around and start you know, getting money and shit for their operations every single week to uh, try to get more um, control over the media. But yet, you know, they can't just be completely eliminated and their entire budget be given to uh, get back Mr. Bergdahl. So the FCC can go fuck themselves. And every every other agency that's getting money to not bring this guy back. All the other shit that's going on is not important when there is someone who is... Um, captive by another organization. Um, And every single agency and organization that is operating outside of the supposed war on terror and operating in other areas that are not Afghanistan or Iraq or the Arabian Peninsula all those funding should be completely eliminated and all everyone else should literally be put into the same area that they know Mr. Bergdahl is in and go after the guy and blow up and destroy everything around. If you don't know him, smoke checked. If you don't know where the guy is, smoke checked. And just keep going until you have to kill every single person around them to finally get this gentleman back. It is completely reprehensible that money could be given to the FCC or to the IRS or to and anything else. It doesn't really matter what it is. And where are your war bonds now? Got to pay your taxes to fund the government. Keep things going. Got to stop those loopholes. <sighs> and even the drama of you know what we read uh, you know last week about how you know supposedly he had walked off base you know or something and. Uh, went MIA or whatever. Who, who gives a shit if he made a bad decision? Or whether he was just going to get fucking pizza somewhere. Or, you know, even if he was going to do something bad. He's an American citizen, he has rights. So he needs to black bag his ass and bring him back and fucking torture him, whatever. But as long as he's, you know, back in America and, you know, that other stuff is whatever. You know, you want to court martial the guy, you want to put him in prison for, you know, 15 years for, you know, going off, whatever. That's, you know, that's whatever. But he doesn't deserve to be fucking tortured and god forbid limbs lost for proof of life things you know just cutting off a finger to give to some state department person to prove that he's alive or whatever i mean it's just insanity but even one dollar to the fcc or to any other organization that's not bringing him back should be eliminated and given to even a bunch of mercenaries having to go after him to find him and get him back to safety. That's my opinion. 
All those operations in Africa should be ended right now. All the manpower, everything, eliminated. That's what solves the problem. It's stopping all the other gallivanting and all the other BS. To find the person who is lost. Ugh. So that's our episode for uh, Death Metal Chronicles Weekend Edition. Um, House of Cards episode. It is a house of cards, and it will crumble. You can't just keep taxing people at 80 or 90% or whatever, and gallivant around the world, setting up an empire, an empire of imperial magnitude to uh, supposedly exert democratic change and uh, hope that things will change by furthering things on, when then you have everything else in the news telling you that it won't. Enjoy your weekend.